Good evening. Welcome to our Windsor County Forum. Um, we're here with the candidates for Windsor County Senate. My name is Susan Waterman, and I will be timekeeping this evening. And I wanted to welcome Allison Clarkson, Becca White, Chris Morrow, and Richard McCormick, who are going to be speaking with us tonight. Uh, tonight, we'll have, moderating will be Al Alessi. And I would remind everyone that if you appreciate tonight's forum, that you take a few moments out of your very busy evening to click the link underneath of the description of the video to make a donation to the Windsor County Democrats so that we can continue to um, support candidates in, uh, in Windsor County and, and the state um, that hold our democratic values high. So without further ado, I want to hand things over to Al. Thank you so much, Susan. Uh, and thanks for all your effort to put on this series. This is what, our fourth Meet the Candidates night, and we've got some others uh, that are on the way. And uh, it's been really quite, um, quite a lot of fun. And the follow-up and the numbers of people that have watched have been phenomenal, So, um, uh, which is great to hear. We have four candidates uh, tonight that we're gonna be asking questions, uh, the same questions. And uh, for probably the first time in my experience, we have an A in Allison, we have a B with Becca, a C with Chris, and a D with Dick. So uh, we're gonna go the first time through with an A, B, C, D, but then it's gonna, change dramatically from that point on but the first one we have to go and that's just going to be the you know for those that uh, i mean i think for some of you most people in windsor county know about you but um but it, let's assume not Say, give a, a background your story when you first ran for for office uh in terms of windsor county and and let people know a bit about you and chris you not having been one of the office old there's, uh, we would very much like to hear your story as well, but let's start with Allison. Go ahead. Well, thank you, Windsor County Democrats, for inviting us to share who we are and what we stand for. I'm Allison Clarkson, and I live in Woodstock, Vermont. I'm married to Oliver Goodenough, and we have two sons, Ward and William. I'm also the majority leader uh, in the Vermont State Senate. And for six years, I've had the honor of representing the people of Windsor County District. Before serving in the Senate, I represented Plymouth, Reading, and Woodstock in the House of Representatives for 12 years. I bring experience and strong values to this race and a record of effective leadership and votes supporting issues Democrats hold dear. We've had an extraordinarily productive biennium devoted to, in large measure, COVID response and relief helping Vermonters weather the biggest challenge we faced in a century. I am so proud of how we rose to the occasion and of what we've accomplished. <clears throat> we've appropriated historic investments in housing, workforce, clean water, climate change mitigation, childcare, expansion of broadband and economic development. We constructively redistricted, passed two constitutional amendments on to the voters, a major pension reform and additional gun safety measures. I was raised to value community service, compassion for others, a commitment to social and racial justice, a love of the natural world, a belief in fairness and equity and in the American dream. Informed by these values, I believe that at its best, government, especially state government, expresses our care and concern for each other. Government undertakes projects that need to be common endeavors, things we can't do alone. Feeding the hungry, educating our young, housing the less fortunate, building roads and bridges, raising our standard of living and investing in innovation, all things that enable our common good. I'm running for reelection because I love my work as a legislator, solving problems for constituents and all Vermonters. I'd appreciate your vote for another term as your state senator. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. We're going to go to Becca White, Representative Becca White, who is currently state rep from Hartford. And Becca, you're on. Great. Thank you so much, Al. Um, and thank you to all the Windsor County Democrats. Uh, I can't see any of you, but I bet there are a lot of familiar faces out there. Um, 
Uh, I want to start by saying that I believe that every single person deserves the right to thrive in their communities. Uh, and that's really the foundation for why I've endeavored into public service. Uh, I'm 27 years old. I grew up in the village of Wilder, uh, which is within the town of Hartford. And I now live in White River Junction with my husband, Dylan. Uh, we are uh, affordable home owners. Uh, and we have one cat named Miss Kitty who uh, is watching me as I do this, uh, as I converse with you. Um, what you should know about me as you're considering who to vote for in the primary uh, is that I have experience with local government. I served starting at age 20 uh, on the Hartford Select Board, and I was a part of that for four years. Uh, lots of things that we were able to accomplish during that time, um, and some of those experience experiences that I have include uh, town manager selection, working through a budget, uh, and working on energy and resiliency projects on the local level. Uh, once I had served uh, two terms on the select board, uh, there was an open seat for the state rep position here in town. Uh, and I was excited to have the opportunity to run for that seat. And I've held that office for the last two terms. Uh, so it's a big dream of mine to be able to run for office. Uh, if you know me, uh, you probably know a little bit about my background. Uh, and that's when uh, I should note that it's uh, important for me to tell you that my family growing up, uh, we were a no frills household. Um, we were very privileged in the way that we had access to social safety net programs like Dr. Dinosaur, the free lunch program uh, and breakfast program for the schools, as well as a myriad of other services. So for me, when I think about uh, public service, it's not only supporting my community, but giving back on a really personal level uh, because of the help and support that I got from this community growing up. Um, I'm a graduate from the University of Vermont, uh, and I have a degree in history, and I've worked professionally uh, for a solar company called Suncommon, uh, and I've also worked for Efficiency Vermont. Uh, my core values and why uh, you should vote for me include working on economic justice, responding to the climate crisis, so that's my E for environment, uh, and last, uh, equity. Thank you. Thank you, Becca. Our next candidate up is the Chris Morrow. Uh, and Chris, you've not, unlike the other three, you've not been in office. So your answer to this is going to come from a little, uh, a, a kind of a different perspective. And we're all looking forward to hear about your past and, and in part what leads you to, to run at this point uh, for this office. Right. Well, thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Chris Morrow. I have lived in Weston for over 20 years in the house my wife grew up in and where we have raised two daughters together. Uh, I grew up in Manchester as my parents opened and grew the Northshire bookstore. I then went on to Oberlin College, majoring in environmental studies and went overseas in the Peace Corps as a volunteer in Thailand for two years. I subsequently received a master of science degree in environmental policy. After working in Nepal a little bit, I returned home and took over the Northshire Bookstore. During my 23 years at the helm of the bookstore, it expanded twice and added a second location, won state and national awards for excellence, including the Governor's Award for Environmental Excellence, and focused on the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit. During these years, I worked hard as a founding president of Local First Vermont, an organization devoted to strengthening our communities by keeping money circulating in our local economy. I also attended the Vermont Leadership Institute put on by the Snelling Center for Government, which is designed to provide Vermont leaders with a broad perspective on the state, its government, and how to make an impact. I have served on two school boards, multiple book industry boards, the board of the Business Alliance for Local Living Economies, and the Board of Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility. And I am currently Vice President of the Board of the Book Industry Charitable Foundation. I am currently beginning a position with a nonprofit in Washington called Adaptation Leader, which will focus on bringing climate change adaptation best practices to communities and organizations across the country. In other words, I've been privileged to live a very dynamic, varied, and challenging life to date. And I wanna put all that life experience to work for you in Montpelier. I'm full of energy and I'm ready to get to work. Thank you very much. 
Great. Thank you, Chris. And finally, Senator Dick McCormick, your introduction to the, our listeners tonight. Oh, you're muted still, Dick. Sorry. There you Hi, go. I'm Dick McCormick. Uh, since my grandfather died, no one but dental hygienists call me Richard. And uh, although I am on the ballot that way, uh, I live in Bethel with my wife, Cindy. Between us, we have five grown children and six grandchildren. Uh, my grandfather was born and raised here in Bethel. Uh, I was not, but we spent part of every summer here. And as a kid, I cried every time we went home and uh, I've lived here now for over half a century. Um, in my non-political life, uh, I made my living with my guitar for many years, starting in Greenwich Village in the 60s. And uh, as you might imagine, that meant I had to supplement my income. And uh, I was a substitute teacher and I've pounded nails and done deconstruction as well as construction. Um, did some freelance writing in part because I wanted to go into politics. I wanted to show the world how smart I was. And people complained that they couldn't understand my columns because I write like a pretentious ass. So I stopped that. In any case, I have been in the Senate. I was sworn into the Senate February of 1989. Uh, in the intervening years, I was majority leader for four years, during which time we passed civil unions and Act 60. Act 60 did not lower property taxes, but it spread the pain more fairly. Uh, I've chaired the Natural Resources and Energy Committee and the Education Committee. I um, also chaired the Special Committee on um, um, Passenger Rail when Amtrak discontinued the Montrealer. And our report was then became law. Uh, every time the train passes, I say, that's my, that's my train. Uh, is my time really up? My timer just went off. It is now. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> I'm a By great asking guy, that okay. question, you went <laughs> over time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, but keep that thought. We'll get back to it. Um, and you'll all have a chance to build on, on, on these comments, of course, as we proceed. We got one. Uh, I don't have a name as to which of our Windsor County Dems uh, proposed this question, but um, this is going to be challenging to think about and to be concise. Um, this person listed seven items, and out of these seven, what are your top three? three in any order and top three i assume would be in terms of your uh where you'd focus in terms of importance and uh the, and again this is going to make it sort of complicated so before i even say who's going to answer first think about it it's child care climate change health care higher education housing public transportation and reproductive rights. That's quite a list of seven. And, and I, I know they're all things that you've all been involved in one way or the other, but to prioritize those is a, certainly a challenge. So- um, Can the, you repeat those please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Childcare, climate change, healthcare, higher education, housing, public transportation and reproductive rights okay you've all got them down chris it happened to be you next actually of using my magic letter uh mixer so um you're up okay um well of those seven which is quite a good list i would take uh child care climate change and housing um Really, the, the housing crisis, which uh, thanks to some of the people on this call got somewhat addressed um, in the last session, uh, is really, really a major problem. It was a problem when I was running my business in Manchester, um, getting employees, they had to live far away and drive in, and it's only gotten worse. Uh, it affects all levels of our state um, from the, the homeless to uh, workforce housing. Um, it's really just at all levels of the state, 
and it needs to be addressed and addressed quickly. And uh, I'm looking forward to the investments from the federal dollars to being put into place in the next few years. Um, but after that federal money runs away, goes away, we are still gonna need to um, deal with this issue because it's a long-term fix and uh, it's essential to uh, the future of Vermont. Um, Childcare is related to this, obviously, housing. Um, affordable housing, childcare uh, is essential. All the research points to children getting care early in the years, uh, early in their life, um, leading to vitality and health through their whole lives. And, and it's really a sound investment from a public policy point of view. And climate change is, is just the overarching um, issue of our time in a lot of ways. And um, I look forward to hopefully talking more about that because that's an issue that's uh, dear to my heart and something I've spent a lot of time thinking about. Um, but briefly, um, we need to work on mitigation as um, we tried to in the last session. Um, but also I, we need to, to think about um, adaptation and resilience with regards to climate change, because it's here, it's only gonna get worse, even if we were to go to zero emissions tomorrow. And um, I think we need to spend a lot more time um, thinking about how we adapt to the changing climate and what that means for Vermont in the coming years. Great, thanks, Chris. Our next responder is Allison. I know, and this is really hard because they're all seven. You, I mean, it, so it's a difficult to narrow it down. But if you had to, the three that would be the top on your list. Uh, you're muted, so unmute first. I was taking Susan. I was, I was really trying to be so good. Uh, <laughs> so you're right. It's impossible to make these choices, but certainly as uh, my dear friend, uh, Dick McCormick would say, uh, the existential challenge of our time is climate change mitigation. And uh, we, it, it, one of the great frustrations of, of this session was obviously the veto of the clean heat standard, but I would take climate change mitigation, housing and reproductive rights, just to be a little different. Um, <clears throat> climate change mitigation is critically important uh, both adaptation, resiliency, and actually re reducing the carbon to our entire economy, to our way of life, to our world, to our planet, for our grandchildren and great-grandchildren, if we're lucky enough to have them. Uh, <clears throat> housing is one of the most important economic development uh, issues we have to deal with. We do not have enough housing. We need to build 6,000 units in the Upper Valley almost alone. Uh, and we, uh, several of us were at a housing summit the other morning which uh, reinforced that. And uh, we have passed this session, uh, we, in this biennium over almost $300 million invested in housing. Affordable housing, bringing people out of homelessness and middle income, middle mixed housing and middle income housing. Uh, and we have worked on that and support supportive housing, which is another whole need, which is a, 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 an ongoing challenge. And then the third reproductive uh, uh, liberty, I'm uh, very proud of our work in getting this through. And so I'm a, a, a big supporter, actually, of both our constitutional amendments, but this one I'm proudest of. Thank you so much, Allison. Uh, Senator McCormick, you're next. Um, again, a difficult task, but give it a, give us your top three. Well, I'm going to sort of escape from that trap of having to choose three out of seven because climate change includes mass transit. Uh, the big villain on carbon is transportation. And, uh, and uh, so I, I, I'm going to say that climate change is the, the overarching existential crisis of our time. It matters. Let's say, well, overarching. That's what overarching means. I think that speaks for itself. The debate on the science ended years ago, and and now uh, it is it is a matter of what are we going to do about it. Uh, and and most of the our carbon footprint is transportation. Uh, reproductive freedom is certainly the most urgent and pressing. And I'm I had the honor of being on 
the uh, natural resource, I'm sorry, the um, health and welfare committee when the amendment came up, obviously I supported it in principle. I wasn't sure if we should be amending the constitution, but I was persuaded and, uh, and uh, very persuaded and uh, came out swinging on it. And I think, yeah, I'm, we're getting, beginning to get some pushback now. And I think it's, it shows how important it is that we, um, that we pursue that. Um, and then um, was healthcare one of the uh, yes. list? Yeah. Yes, it was. Healthcare. I first ran in 1988, and my position paper on healthcare then said every civilized country but South Africa and the United States has healthcare as a right. And South Africa has since then cleaned up its act. All right, great. Thank you. And Becca, uh, your top three. Thanks, Al. Um, I too was struggling to try to rank these and I went for uh, the things that I've heard knocking at the door. Um, I've been out talking to constituents and what's so interesting about Windsor County voters is the diversity of lived experiences. But across the board, what I've heard the loudest when I've knocked on doors is affordable housing. Uh, when Vermonters are unable to make decisions uh, about whether, when they're being forced to make decisions about medical expenses, where they're going to live and afford to to be where they want to live and then any food any other choice energy all of that is sitting on whether or not they can afford to live where they want to live and where they want to stay um so i would say that's the foundational issue that i've heard about from folks at this point um and the issue that i'll be continuing to work on um if i have the privilege of being elected to the senate um then i was thinking about the unique qualities that the senate has compared to the house um as a current state rep i'm on the transportation committee and sander mccormick is spot on 42% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from transportation. That's why I requested to be on that committee. That's why I moved the Transportation uh, Modernization Act in my first biennium and the Transportation Innovation Act in my second biennium. So climate change would be number two for me. Um, but because we're different from the House, if I were to be in the Senate, we have two committee options. So I wanted to think I would prioritize based on what committee of jurisdiction I was on. Um, and I'd like to be on a committee that has a robust ability to respond to climate change. And I'd also like to be on a committee that responds to child care, because that's the issue that's keeping working women out of the workforce now. 80% of the people who have not returned to our workforce in Vermont are women. That's a problem. Child care is a foundational issue to why that's happening. Great, thank you for that. Um, my next question, and I did this on purpose a little bit, but it, it, had, it had just been on the list anyway, but I thought of, uh, we take one of those seven and kind of drill in, okay? So the, the one I picked, uh, because it was already on the list, was the public transportation piece. Um, so, what are the key pieces we'd need to make that change? What's missing? What legislation would we provide or have we that are what what steps haven't been taken yet, which have been? How far away are we from having meaningful change? And uh, uh, this actually, Becca, uh, sorry, you're first again, but continue. OK, well, this is really my uh, you've given me the softball question, Al, because sorry. serving on transportation, um, zero fare public transportation was something I fought tooth and nail for in this last biennium. Um, it was something that we debated fiercely um, to continue. Uh, if you're someone who's used public transportation during the pandemic, you will have noticed that it is fare free. You're not paying a fare when you get on the bus or you get in a car van pool, whatever your source of public transportation. Um, what I see as the future of public transportation in Vermont is continuing policies like that that make them equitable, but we are missing one key thing in Vermont that makes public transportation work, and that's scale. We don't have the amount of people needed except for in really tight hubs like White River Junction with advanced transit or downtown Windsor or Springfield. So what we need to invest in is creative solutions like microtransit. And microtransit is kind of my, if you've heard me talk about it, you know it's my favorite subject. And it's like Uber or Lyft. It's a public free 
microtransit system that we have employed in Montpelier right now as a pilot program. So it means that you get on your smartphone and I'll say uh, Dick McCormick's brother, Kurt McCormick, he can figure it out. So I know anyone can figure this app out. <laughs> He's not a smartphone guy. You get on it. You say, I want to be picked up here at the state house and I want to get to my appointment uh, up at the top of the hill at the hospital uh, by 3.30. They'll pick you up. It's safe. It's free. And then you get to where you need to go to meet your appointment. That's the last mile. And that's what I think we need to do around public transportation. Great. Thank you very much. Um, Chris, you're next on this question about ways, you know, some details on how we would solve uh, the transportation issues and improve our situation in that regard. Oh, well, thank you. Um, it is indeed a, an important issue. I remember when I was living in Thailand, we had, um, and I was living in a very rural area, we had uh, all kinds of public transportation options. Um, you know, from rail to buses to small rickshaw type devices to get to really anywhere you wanted to go. And it was a huge um, convenience and also economic driver because people knew they could get to where they wanted to go from their home into town, do their shopping, go to work. Um, and it was, it was very effective. Um, I think Becca points to the main challenge in Vermont, which is scale. Um, and uh, on, on the, the west side of the state, we've tried to get rail going um, more successfully and, and have um, faced scale issues. Um, but there are, there are bus systems that have developed in pockets of Vermont. I think what we really need is a lot more coordination and um, clarity on the financing and subsidization of the whole system because it really, um, without the scale, um, and if you are going to zero fare, which is, is um, a nice thing to have, um, then there's, it's gonna be an expensive prospect. Um, I think with electrification of vehicles that will, will help and this pilot project of micro transit sounds, sounds excellent. And uh, I think we could start working electric bicycles into this whole mix because they're powered um, and you can go a lot further um, with electric bicycles. And it's, it's really something that um, is important. And uh, you know, personally, I need to do some more research on to, to, uh, before I get in the legislature. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Dick, you're next on this, uh, and I know this is an area you uh, have also addressed uh, in your earlier comments, but dig into it deeper for us now. Yeah, and I'm going to kind of torture this question into the question I wish you would ask, but <laughs> it's that uh, mass transit is part of, of a larger question, which is just alternatives to the individual gas guzzler being used for multiple trips every day with one person in the car that we need to, to get off of our wastefulness regarding gasoline and regarding uh, introduction of carbon. So Matt, since the question was mass transit, I'll start with that. Uh, uh, build it and they will come. I already claimed credit for the Vermonter train. My brother Kurt was the father of the Ethan Allen train and the two of us worked together so there would not be an east side West Side Civil War, uh, but but the fact is, I don't always take Amtrak when I travel because the schedule doesn't work. We've got one southbound Vermonter and one northbound Vermonter, and often my schedule doesn't work. We need more mass transit. That also, I live in Bethel, uh, up and down Interstate 89. There's a commuter bus bus route, and sometimes, and I hate to say it, but when fuel prices are up it's standing room only. And when the prices go down, people get back in their cars. And I'm not saying that we need to torture people with high gas prices. Uh, God forbid anyone should talk about a carbon tax, but I think what we do need are incentives to conserve energy and disincentives to waste energy. And my time is up. Oh, you still have 30 seconds. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh okay, thanks. Uh, the... Uh, the infrastructure. I ride a bicycle. 
I live a mile and a half from town. I usually drive to town. It's not safe for me to ride my bike. Uh, the shoulders are too narrow. That is just yet one example. And when we talk bike paths, we, we think of as recreational. Well, that's good, they are, but they also ought to be part of how you travel, how you get where you're going. Um, Ireland, I remember seeing guys in overcoats with brief, briefcases getting on their bikes, nuns in their habits getting on their bikes. It's how you get from here or there. And uh, we don't make our, our roads that way. I think now my 30 seconds is up. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And I uh, definitely can, as a biker myself, I can attest to the lack of, of shoulders. So uh, thanks for bringing that up. Um, Allison, you are up for this question on transportation and how you'd see it changing. <laughs> I, th I think everybody's had very good answers so far. I'm a, I'm a big believer in micro uh, transit, just like Becca. If we're talking about public transportation in a rural state, it's a big challenge. And I think we need to be as, as creative as possible, not only incenting micro transportation, but also carpooling. We need to do much more carpooling. We're building out our, um, you know, our, our, ah, we're, we're building out the places we could park by the interstate. Our, what do we call them? I'm totally punting. Park and rides. Park and rides. Thank you, Becca. We are building out our park and rides and, and, and to add the bus, you know, if I knew that a bus was going to pick me up at the Bethel park and ride, I would not have to drive to Montpelier twice a week. You know, it would be great. Uh, I would love to do that. But also, I think we need to connect our younger drivers who need experience with our older drivers who shouldn't maybe be driving quite as much as they are. Uh, the younger drivers need that experience. Driver's Ed will give them credit. And we could get, uh, we could have more older drivers maybe feeling more comfortable and trusting uh, that they would have a way to get to doctor's appointments and to other things. So I think, I think we need to get really creative about about the drivers we do have and how we compare them with uh, the drivers we might like to have fewer of. I think we uh, definitely need to work on alternatives to single drivers. I think we need to be investing much more in bringing back our rail. Uh, it is heartbreaking what the 50s did to our rail system. And uh, <clears throat> I think we need to continue to drive housing development into our downtown and village centers so that uh, we can live where we work. And that means we can walk or bike. And having just come from Cambridge, uh, where they have so many, they've invested enormously in bike lanes, bus lanes and bike lanes. And it's very expensive to add that, as Becca knows, anybody who's served on transportation, it's very expensive to add that extra two feet onto a road, but we need to be doing it. And we need to be doing it with every new road that we build. Uh, but it's, it's a housing solution. It's a creative solution. There are all sorts of great things we can be exploring. We don't need to reinvent the wheel on this. The world is doing it. Uh, we just need to finance it and, um, and embrace change. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, again, I'm going to feed off these one though. We are going to make some uh, directional changes momentarily, but you just brought up. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Chris. I, did you, am I on the wrong list going across? Be Becca was no. going to add something to Al. I oh, think. go ahead, Becca. Oh, she didn't? Oh, no, I, all right. I, I did I did just want to add one piece, which if folks are wondering about the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, I think that there were some real opportunities that we were able to take advantage of this legislative session. Um, and it's a good year if you're interested in public transportation um, to look back at some of the work we did. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, and we haven't spent all that money yet. My next question is that was the uh, that, that was the uh, end that you all had a chance to uh, talk about that. The next one ties into it and it, even off of what you had had just been saying, Allison, the because uh, it would also seem that if housing and employment were more centrally located in in cities and towns and villages that it becomes less of the demand that we had seen. So I want to uh, think or ask you each to talk about um, how you'd envision through legislation and, and advocacy uh, 
redeveloping our cities, towns, and villages uh, to meet the coming decades in our state. Uh, and Dick, this is you first. And with Bethel being a great example of that, and I know there's <clears throat> been a lot of effort in Bethel to make changes. So, uh, but wherever you look in Vermont, go for it. Yeah, my fellow Bethelonians are doing a great job. Actually, I don't know if people noticed someone walking by while I was talking last night. It was my wife, Cindy, returning from a meeting of the Bethel Food Shelf. We are an uh, active community here. Uh, now, I guess it was the garden, the, the community garden. Uh, the villages and cities are not going to thrive by themselves. Market forces are not friendly to our downtowns. People want, a lot of people have their ideal is to live out in the country and uh, a little bit of Connecticut in Vermont. And uh, Vermonters drive more per capita than the people of any other state. And it's because we live spread out. And to try to incent people to live downtown is, is a real challenge. I voted in favor of a downtown development bill that I really hate. It has things on Act 250 that I don't like at all. But no way was I going to vote against a downtown development bill because we have to incent development in our downtowns to take the pressure off our countryside, to take the pressure off our, um, our forest. The path of least resistance for development is a, is a field. But and I'm out of town. Is that it, Susan? Was that? Yeah. No, you had 30 seconds left. OK, the, when the sign comes up. That means you have 30 read, seconds. I don't read it. I just see that it's there. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like going back to first grade. All right. Uh, okay. Dick, no, wait, let, me, let me just say, with Act yeah, 250, the, there are new pressures in particular with the improvements in, in electronic communication and the ability to work at home, the pressures, the development pressures on our countryside and our forests are greater than they've ever been. And so we don't want to start loosening up on our ability to uh, regulate development. I would, uh, I would agree wholeheartedly on that. Uh, uh, Becca, you're next on answering or developing uh, the areas that you'd like to see change or legislation enacted of, that has to do with downtown development. Sure. Well, I'll just start by saying that our two incumbent senators, I think we do have to give a real hearty thank you for the work that they've done on this exact topic. Um, that big shoes to fill on this one. Um, for me, when I look at the work that's been done in my downtown, White River Junction, this last Friday, actually, Senator McCormick and I enjoyed a first Friday um, that is the kind of creative economy work that revitalizes our downtowns and draws in people who are my age, and it draws in older Vermonters who want to age in place, who want a walkable downtown. So for me, the legislative actions that I'm supportive of are things like the tax incremental financing districts, TIF districts. It's what downtown White River Junction has been able to use to reinvest in our community with that sidewalk improvement, wastewater water and sewer. I mean, all of that is the undergirding to how we improve our designated downtowns. Um, and there's some legislative work that was done um, in Representative Charlie Kimball um, is one of the key people on that. Um, the other piece that I wanted to highlight for this group is how we incorporate mixed use within our downtowns. Um, White River Junction uh, is a real poster child for having affordable housing embedded in housing that's um, re retail rate or like market rate. Uh, so when you have a beautiful development um, from someone like Matt Busey, um, where it's just a gorgeous a uh, property that also has affordable housing in it, that lifts up the entire community. Um, so 
for me, it's how do we invest in those downtowns? How do we support the creative economy? And how do we support developers making the right decisions in the right places um, for our downtowns? Great, thank you so much. Um, Allison. Thank you. Uh, well, I, this is an area that I've, as Vice Chair of Senate Economic Development, Housing and General Affairs, this has been our top priority uh, for the last several sessions. And um, we have, we all, we need to continue to do this work, but we've done a lot to take what's already there and make more of it. So we have a lot in our downtowns and village centers. We have a lot of buildings that we're not taking full advantage of. We have second and third floors that are vacant. We have big houses in our downtowns that we could be creating uh, accessory dwelling units in, ADUs. We have incented that and we've provided all sorts of navigational help. We every downtown could do with more ADUs. And we uh, have also incented unprovided grants for uh, landlords that have uh, let uh, properties go a bit that are vacant, blighted, or uh, not code compliant. We have grants for people to, uh, to improve their properties and bring them back online. So it's like, you know, the best energy is the energy we don't use. This In this case, we are not using what some of the infrastructure we already have. Becca's talked about one of our most important tools, uh, TIFs. If we could have more TIF districts and mini TIF districts, sort of mini TIF kinds of projects. We need water and sewer in our downtowns uh, everywhere. That means Norwich. That means, uh, you know, uh, uh, that means a lot of towns that don't have water and sewer yet really need them for us to be able to drive more development, smart growth. We've also invested in modernizing our bylaws, our town and village bylaws. The zoning work can be, we've invested in, 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 in our towns being able to take advantage uh, of these bylaw modernization grants. Also, um, ba -ba -ba -bum, priority housing. We enabled uh, our priority housing to have more housing uh, uh, in 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 towns that are are fairly small, but we're we've incented the ability to have a, a, a development of 50 units rather than just 25 in our smaller towns. But we need to continue this work. There's lots still to do on it, but there's lots of exciting opportunities now that we have uh, we've passed. Great to hear. Thank you. And Chris, your thoughts on uh, city, town, village development directions, paths, solutions? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, we've, we've covered most of it already. Um, I think zoning, local zoning is, is crucial um, and dictates a lot of what happens in town. So um, that's not state level, but the state can support local zoning boards modernizing and expanding their visions for their own uh, towns. Um, you know, making it walkable and and bike friendly. We've talked a little bit about that already, but those those are actually um, very important. You know, sidewalks. You know, there's some towns that don't have sidewalks, uh, and certainly lots that don't have bike lanes. Um, and I think we need to focus more on supporting uh, our local businesses. You know, people aren't going to walk around town if the services aren't there. So. Um, that's partly public policy, but it's also partly just civic policy of, of um, encouraging people to support their local independent businesses so they can stay in business and so you can walk down the street and get whatever it is you need instead of going online. And to the degree that uh, tax policy um, or education can help do this, um, that would go a long way to creating towns that people want to live in because they won't live there if they, if they can't get their services. Um, and tax policy, um, as has been dis discussed, um, can support this to uh, a great degree. And um, mixed use also, you know, in many locations, having retail on the first floor and uh, living quarters on the second and third and maybe fourth floors, um, is certainly uh, a superior way to design uh, our towns and cities. So um, I think that's it. Thank Great. you. Great. Thank you. I had a, a question that, that was sent to me today. Um, 
of the many vetoes signed by Governor Scott uh, over the last, uh, well, since he's been governor, um, they were curious as to which did you find the least objectionable and which perhaps the most frustrating veto that he uh, enjoined. And uh, Chris, I'm gonna go with you first. Um, you may not have the institutional memory to, uh, and I understand that, but uh, reinterpret that for your own purposes, something uh, that, that might apply to that question. Um, yeah, well, I, I, I'm not as up on this as, as everyone else, for sure. Um, I think rejection of the clean heat standard was, was very unfortunate. I understood his reasoning, um, not understanding the cost of something um, that with, with the implications uh, and impact of the clean heat, clean heat standard uh, is, is a legitimate concern. But uh, given where we are with um, climate change and how late we are to the game and how much thought went into that program uh, and the support behind it, um, I think that, uh, that, that that was very unfortunate. Um, we really need to work on climate change at all, at all levels and um, in, including our, our heating systems. Um, fortunately, um, with ground source and air source heat pumps and, and incentives around those and their efficiency growing, um, there is a transition happening towards uh, converting our heat to electricity, um, but anything we can do to accelerate that would be important and, and appreciated. Um, and in terms of least objectionable, um, I'm actually um, not sure. I know he's um, vetoed um, close to 30 or more than 30 bills at this point, um, um, but I'm going to leave it at that and let the others take That's it. That's all right. And don't feel, any of you don't have to do both of those. That's a kind of a two-pronged question. Um, but um, Allison, you are next on the list of most objectionable and least uh, of Governor Scott's vetoes. Muted, you're muted though. I'm trying to be so good. Um, all of his vetoes are objectionable. There isn't <laughs> one of them that isn't objectionable. Well, Partly most though, yeah, it, but yeah. It represents, oh, I'm just, I have to say this as a legislator, it represents his lack of engagement with the process. And that is incredibly frustrating. Doug, I've served under Governor Douglas as well. Governor Douglas worked with us when things began to get objectionable in the process. We were much more productive and able to address the governor's concerns before we got to a veto. Think of the taxpayer waste of time in two committees spending all that time on a bill that is gonna get vetoed. Anyway, it's enraging. Uh, and yes, he's done a great job on COVID, but he, is enraging on all these other things. The most puzzling veto is the pension bill. We had unanimous votes on these and we had a unanimous, first historic unanimous override of a governor's veto. Why did he veto that bill? It's a total puzzlement. Uh, the most frustrating vetoes for me have been paid family leave, minimum wage, clean heat standard, the rental housing and safety bill, I, you know, you name it. I, I work on a ton of things he vetoes. Almost everything I do, he vetoes. So, and it's not I, it's we, we do all these things together. Uh, and it's just, vetoes represent the dashing of the hopes of 180 legislators who've worked together on something to get it across the finish line. And it is, people should be frustrated because this is a huge waste of our time and money. That's a great insight. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Becca, you're next on that. Um, thanks, Al. Yeah, I fully agree with what we just heard from Senator Clarkson. Um, I, of the 29 vetoes that Phil Scott has done um, in his tenure as governor, that's more than any previous governor. From my understanding, it's 10 more than the closest 
person to have a veto record high enough um, to be counted. Um, for me, the clean heat standard was devastating. I'm to be frank, when we lost the override, um, I had to go out of the state house and cry because it represents to me um, an injustice against future generations. And I really appreciated um, the vote explanation we got from Representative Sarah Copenhansis, um, where she actually reflected that exact point. Um, if I had to pick one that maybe wasn't the one that I was, you know, going outside and um, having to process, um, that would be hard. Um, I still want to learn more about ranked choice voting, and I know we just let that become law. Um, there are some uh, charter changes that I believe he vetoed that I guess that's the one if I had to pick. Um, some of the other things that he vetoed that I do think is Democrats, we really need to hold um, his feet to the fire on. Um, although he came back on it, but um, gun violence prevention, he's been able to play the game against the legislature to exactly how he wants gun legislation to be written. And we're at a point where we are at a crisis moment. Uh, and to be able to have a governor who can just veto um, uh, as in important legislation is that where we need to get a hundred people in the house um, to override it. That's just unfair. Um, and it stacks the game against the most vulnerable Vermonters. Um, so on any issue, whether it be gun violence prevention, affordable housing, uh, and the rental registry work that we did, all of that, um, to exactly to Senator Clarkson's point, you're just getting dashed hopes. And it doesn't set up a fair fight when we're an unstaffed legislative body unlike uh, the governor's office. Great, that is more great insight. And uh, Senator McCormick, your uh, last on this question, how would you add to that? Okay, well, I'll start with the, with the veto that I, I thought was defensible. It was a bill that I voted for and then decided to uphold the veto. And that was a charter change for the city of Brattleboro, town of Brattleboro, that would allow 16-year-olds uh, to vote. I voted for that. And then your classic angry guys would come up to me and say, you just voted to not treat 21-year-old criminals as criminals because they're not fully developed yet. How could you then vote for 16-year-olds to vote? And I found myself uh, unable to pass the straight face test. I found it very difficult to explain to them how I could reconcile those two votes. And I had one of those moments where, you know, you sleep better. I said, I think I was wrong. I think I made a mistake. I think the governor is right about this. So I supported him on that. Um, but otherwise, the pattern of vetoes has already, has already, has already been said is outrageous he has and i was phil scott's first committee chair and he and i worked well together and i've always spoken well of him as his conciliatory bipartisan approach and he has betrayed himself in my view he has really this is not the phil scott i knew and liked and um there's a level of imperiousness and hostility and also frankly Peel off the nice guy stuff. You got a Republican. You got a guy who's saying this is all well and good, but you know, next quarter's bottom line won't be quite as good if we have this reasonable legislation. This that's the idea that we're Democrats. We take next quarter's bottom line seriously. We know the business of America is to do business, but the next quarter's bottom line is not the definitive sole measure of all things. And I, I'm afraid that my friend Phil Scott thinks that it is. And so what you see is, is this real indifference to issues that matter a lot, not just to the 180 legislators, to the 630,000 people we represent as well. Thank you, appreciate that. This may be our last question. It, it may push us slightly over the eight o'clock line. If that's, can we just get through this one Question? Okay. Uh, and this is something that Senator Clarkson and I, I, I had a chance to ask you uh, in passing, I don't even remember where, but it had to do with um, public tax dollars going to 
uh, private schools and potentially private religious schools. And it was a short, we had a short moment to chat. And I was wondering, and I've heard it from other folks uh, on social media and elsewhere. Um, and it seems like this might be a, a good opportunity to get some clarity on that as to what our options are. Um, it certainly br brings up folks' emotions pretty quickly. Uh, so could you start us with that, Senator Clarkson, please? Oh, it's... <laughs> uh, <clears throat> well, we are, just to frame it up for people, we're one of only two states in the entire United States that allow public tax dollars to go to private institutions. Uh, we are now in a battle with the Supreme Court and we are in some ways waiting for the Supreme Court. Okay, so the two states are Maine and Vermont. And this system developed because our rural towns, not every town was willing to or was able to afford a high school, a middle or high school. So what developed over the last hundred years is this system of uh, taking our public tax dollars and, 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 and paying for public education, but also uh, enabling it to go to private institutions. So it's an anathema in 48 other states. May, so the Supreme Court decision several years ago uh, has, is really challenging this and saying not only is it going to be allowed to go to private not you know private independent schools, but you must also use it for parochial schools and for dual enrollment. Maine is challenging that, and and I in in large measure we're waiting for the Maine decision coming from the Supreme Court about how it's going to be dealt with. Um, but I know we will have a battle royal if the Supreme Court decision comes down and says public money will be able to go to parochial schools and to religious institutions. And that will call the, I, I think that will call the question on public dollars going to private independent schools. It is already a challenging subject for many legislators. Yes. I, uh, as you know, have been very invested in limiting uh, tax dollars going out of state. I mean, at least public tax dollars can be used in state for teachers and you know, it's an economic development thing in state. You cannot even justify it going out of state. Yeah. So uh, that still hasn't been fully worked on. But I think this is going to be a huge challenge to us going forward, depending on what the Supreme Court decides about the main case. And we're yep. really well, the reason we took no action this year is people really wanted to wait and see what was going to happen with the Supreme Court case in Maine. And the All main right. Case. Good. And, and just for the listeners, the, the sort of the private schools, quote, uh, the, uh, are things like Thetford Academy and then Sharon Academy and come to mind in, in Windsor County that are, right? Is that what you mean by, I mean, those are yes, schools that Waldorf, are getting- The Waldorf School. In Waldorf, okay. I mean, there, yeah. there, there are quite a few of them. West, you know, the, you know there, there, there are quite a few of them. There are the four traditional academies, uh, which are, which we, my guesses would be in play to be, to come up with a special status, but it will be, this will be a big challenge for us. If, All right. Uh, and anyway. All right. Thank you. Uh, Senator McCormick. I got myself into a lot of trouble when I was chair of education because I put forward a bill to require that any private school that received public money would have to play by the same rules as public schools. And um, the pushback on that was, was pretty intense. I think in the ensuing years, um, a lot of people have come around to, to that uh, thinking, to my thinking, that, that uh, these are tax dollars and they're the people, it's the people's money. And we, the people's legislature, make laws pertaining to the public schools. Well, this is public money. And so it shouldn't be used for, for, um, for other uses other than, than uh, properly uh, legislated public uses. Uh, in particular, I have a problem with religious schools and I do not have a problem with religion or with religious education. 
but we are a nation of people of many different beliefs and many different uh, religious affiliations. And um, some people don't necessarily want their tax dollars used to uh, proselytize for other um, religions. And um, uh, I think that, that actually uh, my colleague, the, Allison, has spoken well on the issue. I would just, this is not the first time after Allison has spoken, and that's my turn that I've said what she said. What she said. So <laughs> I would just say what she said. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Chris Morrow, you're uh, interesting that you lived in a, in a, a another country where Christianity was... Uh, a relatively small component of that anyway. But anyway, this isn't just about religious school, just broadly in terms of the concept of tax doll public tax dollars and private school, <clears throat> whether religious or otherwise. Your thoughts and, and uh, insights on that? Yeah, well, I'm a, I'm a proponent for school choice because I've, I've lived it and my kids have lived it. Um, you know, my youngest daughter just graduated from Burn Burton Academy in Manchester. Uh, there is no public high school. And uh, so if there was no uh, choice, then <laughs> I don't know what she would have done. Um, you know, the, the, the fact just because it's quote unquote private doesn't mean um, that they're not supporting the local economy in, in and state economy for that matter. You have people coming in from all over the world to attend our academies um, and generating tremendous amount of, of tax revenue for the state and for, uh, in this case, Manchester. Um, uh, way, in, in, way more than uh, I think is spent. Um, but it's really a question of, of choice for, and you know, it's our local tax dollars and where are we going to spend them? And it, certainly, if we don't have a an alternative, um, then we need to be able to send our kids to good school. Um, it actually works to our benefit because the private side, because they can raise so much money privately and just increase the value of the education that all students, all students, uh, you don't have to apply to get in. Um, all school students benefit from that. Um, I do start having issues once we get into the, the realm of, of, of religious schools um, because of the separation of church and state. And um, that may, makes me more nervous. But overall, the concept of, of school choice does not bother me because I've seen how it benefits uh, the, the kids down in Manchester and the whole. And, and in Weston, we send our kids from Weston to Burn Burton Academy, and it works quite well. Great, thank you for sharing that. And ending our questions uh, and answers tonight, Representative White, you're up. Thanks. Um, I'll just start by saying I'm a proud Hartford High uh, and public school system graduate. I did my entire tenure, uh, both through high school and college at public universities as well um, with UVM. Um, for me, uh, where I think you'll see a difference between Chris and I, for example, as the two new folks, um, is I think that whenever we have a drain against our public schools, we're directly harming the most vulnerable children in our communities. So in any instance that we could be supporting public schools over private academies, that's where I stand. Um, what concerns me on top of that is when we have private institutions that for low income students offer financial aid and then are getting the cream on top, which is those vouchers. Uh, so I don't support that type of use for public dollars. What I do support is when there are uh, learning challenges or special circumstances where children need a different option than what's available for them in public school, or like in the case where there is not an available high school. Those situations are different to me than what we're experiencing um, with some of the wealthier elite institutions that have typically denied the most challenging critical cases for students who need education support. What ends up happening is the public school then takes those students on and the cost to educate them is higher 
So we're continuing to ask our public schools and our public administrators to do the heavy lift within our community while not giving them equal funding when we compare it to private institutions. The last thing I wanna note is we have queer youth in our communities. And it is not fair to me that they do not have the same options for education if there's a religious school that is telling them they're not accepted. Um, I'm not aware of that situation in Windsor County, but if I were to become aware of that situation, that would have, um, that would really light a fire um, because protecting queer youth and trans youth is um, extremely important to me. Thank you so much. And uh, it's a, certainly going to have a lot of controversy uh, depending on, as uh, Senator Clarkson mentioned, the Supreme Court case and and other changes as they come up. But thank you all so much. And I'm going to hand this back over to Susan to close it out. Well, thank you very much, Al. And thank you very much for um, Becca and Chris and Dick and Allison. I appreciate you all so much for coming in tonight. Um, it's a it's it's a hard call to be a public servant and um, and I appreciate all of you so much for for doing that.